Hey everybody, welcome back to Small Talk Japan. On this show we talk about all things Japan in English. My name is Mitch, this is my co-host today. Josh. Hey Josh. Hi. Got a great show for you guys today. We're going to talk about how Japan is totally going to actually, really, this is not sarcastic, it's actually going to open for everybody. And no babysitters. Like, actually? Actually. Finally. It's, it's actually from a pretty, like, reputable source. Actually, that article was also sent to us by our one of our patrons in our Discord group. Nice. I was going to send it to you, and then you already sent it to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm on top of this shit. Yeah. But thank you for the link, Mr. Patron. Mrs. Patron or Mr. Patron? Mr. Patron. Nice. Uh, we're also going to talk about how Japan's totally, at the same time, going to reverse course on uh, post-Fukushima nuclear bans. <laughs> and we're also going to talk about... Uh, no, we're going to skip that one for now. We're going to talk about how, you know, there's a, there's a giant Ferris wheel in Tokyo that's closing. If you don't get in before August 31st, it's going to be gone forever. And we're also going to talk about some fun topics. Like, well, this one's not so fun, but uh, how Japanese scientists are making monkeys depressed with stimulation. There's actually a reason for this, but it is kind of really sad. <laughs> some very nice advice from Mr. Miyazaki from the Ghibli Studios. Yeah. Uh, egg slut which is something that I didn't know about. It's a thing. <laughs> uh, coming to Japan and their whole ass eel sandwich. <laughs> and Brad Pitt. Burapi. 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 And his teary-eyed promotion of his new movie in Japan. Roll that intro. So today, outside, there's a bunch of people in Yukata walking around because it's the Yukata event in Temonkan. Yeah. And I was actually really happy to see all the families and the people out and like it, it looks kind of like a festival. It's nice. The one thing I do want to say though is now that the crowds are back, I have to. I forgot how bad it was to walk and cycle through crowded downtown Japan. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I, I totally forgot how this felt like until today. Well, not just Japan. I think it's a Kagoshima thing more than anything. It's not so bad in like large sidewalky areas and say like Tokyo and stuff like that. Also because there's actually a YouTube video on this. If you ride around in Tokyo or other like larger areas, if you jingle your, your bell, bring, that, sounds, that sounds really sexual, but I don't mean it in a sexual way. If just, you jingle your bell, people will automatically walk towards the inside of the of the street they'll walk away from the the, the out, outer side of the sidewalk mm. and so, and then you can pass by on your bicycle they don't even it's like an automatic response right. and it's it's hilarious because this video is not a guy on a bicycle it's just a guy with a bicycle bell oh i've seen that just video walking around like ringing the bell and then people like move over yeah he even does it like on an escalator and then people on the escalator <laughs> just <laughs> move over so like so that happens in the major metropolitan areas but then you come here to kagoshima and they're like how does walking work yeah they're just not very good at it and every now and then you get a bunch of like jerks that get it, like in this like it's like the red rover red rover wall they yeah. make a, like a wall. They like challenge you to like get through them. And one time I remember, I think I said this on the show before, I was walking and all these drunk salary men made like a giant wall and they're just like coming at me and I was just looking at them like, what am I supposed to do? So I just started clapping to like get them to look up and notice what was happening. And they're like, oh, we're being dumbasses. I'm like, yeah. So anyway, that's back. Good job, yeah, everybody. But the Yukatas look really nice. I'm going to go film a bit of the festival after this one thing that's actually kind of interesting is that you know so they're wearing the kimono the yukatas and they have like the same fabric masks that go with it oh a nice little fashion masks. Yeah. accessory yeah that's pretty cool so anyway let's get on to the news um uh first i want to talk about how uh japan is supposedly this is from the nhk so we can probably trust it but apparently the japanese government is deciding to do two things to reopen the country one the the pre-entry covid test which is actually pretty shitty because i did this to get back into the country last two last month two months ago whenever it was and because in a lot of uh western countries they've stopped doing pcr testing entirely right because they're just like fuck it um getting a pcr test that has a certificate that japan will accept which you just keep making that strike zone smaller and smaller and smaller uh, cost a lot of money. And I think it was like $500 or something like that when I got mine to come back. $500? So if you add that to the already kind of inflated prices of flights because they're not running as many flights as they used to because the, all the travel restrictions and everything, it does become like prohibitively expensive to come to the country. Right. So dropping that is a huge hurdle to get people to come back and, you know, and visit the country, which the tourism industry here is hurting so they really we really do need that to happen so that's step one which is good um sorry this is for triple vaxxed people only right which honestly 
at this point, uh, and there might be some exceptions, I think, for people who are double vax and then uh, can prove that they had the virus at one point mm-hmm. and have reco- recovered for it, whatever. But don't take my, I mean, there's, there's, the policy hasn't been completely solidified yet, but that's, that's the idea. And this is supposedly going to happen uh, starting on September 7th. The other thing that's going to happen sometime in September, this comes from NHK. So I do believe that this will happen. Um, and this, surprisingly, I don't think has a lot of support from in the polls, the public polls. And I'll explain why in a minute. But it, starting in September, Japan will uh, move to allow individuals to come into the country without babysitter tour guides, which is great news because most Westerners don't want to have a tour guide. Right. That's the, a very like Asian thing. Yeah. Right? It's Asian or retirement home stuff. Yeah. You, know, you don't, you don't want some lady with a flag, like, you know, cause you're, if you're a tourist, you're already kind of standing out. Right. You don't need a, like a babysitter, like flag you into like predetermined restaurants and shit. You want to find your own path. Yeah. Right? Especially like people like you and me, I think want to go to more like the local places and find like, your own adventure. Yeah. Find your own adventure. Yeah. You don't want to like go with the masses. So they're supposedly going to change that from September. Now, I will say I wouldn't get my flights to Japan today for tomorrow. Okay, I would wait a little bit, but I'd start looking at uh, prices for the beginning of 2023 and maybe uh, Hanami, the um, flower viewing season for 2023, like March and, and the beginning of April, because I think that by that time, the tourist industry will have re- re- like healed and come back enough that prices will be more competitive, availability will be better, and the uh, travel restrictions will be basically lifted and forgotten about, assuming nothing gets weirder with this pandemic. Right. So I would start today by, and you can do this on, there's a, there's a couple websites that you can do this on. One of them is just Google, where you can set it to track flights from airport to airport. So the two major hub airports in Japan that you're going to want to look at is uh, you want to look at Haneda and Narita. But I would also include, because uh, if uh, travel restrictions get even, if they completely free up, there's uh, uh, Fukuoka, uh, Kansai, and even here in Kagoshima, I don't know if, I don't know when that's going to start again. Those are oftentimes accessed through Incheon as a uh, the hub and spoke kind of situation. And so sometimes you can get much cheaper flights into Osaka than you can into, say, Tokyo. Yeah, some of the cheapest flights I've ever gotten into and out of uh Japan into into and out of Japan, especially from Kagoshima, were through uh, Incheon. Yeah, going through to Korea. Yeah, going through Korea. So I would set those trackers now, guys, to to automatically look for uh, cheap flights for dates that you're available that you could p- potentially fly, uh, starting at the beginning of next year. Again, looking at you know Hanami season, which is you know end of March. You got to Google it every year. They predict it as a different time. It's usually the end of March, beginning of April. It's usually right on my birthday. And it's also. It varies depending on the part of Japan as yeah. well. They basically blossom going from the south, moving up north. There's actually a book on this. Uh, 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 some Westerner guy followed the, the 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 cherry blossoms north and wrote a book about it. Anyway, so I would set those trackers now for cheap tickets and things like that for the beginning of next year or for the middle of next year or something like that, because that's really when we're going to start seeing the tourism just come back. Because it said in the article, I already threw it on the ground because, you know, I was done with it, but I'm actually not done with it, <laughs> uh, is that the, I think right now it's like, the daily limit is 10,000 in September. They're going to move that to 50,000 or no. So it's 20,000. Now they're moving to 50,000 next month, but that's still nowhere near where it was when we were talking, like it was in the millions per day before the pandemic. Right. So we really need to get back to that because, you know, we don't want to over tourism because that sucked, but we don't want to have zero tourists because that also sucks. So we want to have, we want to have a good balance. And I think that what they're going to do is um, they're all the, I mean, because China is still basically on lockdown, like China, you know, they're still trying to do the zero COVID policy. And so I don't see a huge wave of Chinese tourists coming into Japan like they did before. So I see the numbers not being so high, but I, I do see uh, the availability going up when, you know, as, as demand increases. So cool. And if you're looking to come here again, 2023 is going to be your year. Yeah, I can't wait. Like, I I also want to travel too. So um, well, you're going you're going for your wedding in Hawaii. That's true. Yeah, I'll be traveling to Hawaii. I'm hoping by that point I won't have to 
get a PCR test coming back. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's according to the news. I mean, that's that's the that's the deal. They're they're ending it ne- next month. So, um, yeah, that that was really like because that's like a day before I came back to the country, and I go to the clinic, and it's like you pay online and everything, and because the weak yen. Oh, that's another thing. The the government is leveraging the fact that the, the because the the yen is so weak right now. Yeah, dude, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like. It's like a million bazillion yen to the dollar right now. Uh, let's just go to yen dollar right now. And uh, oops, it's 0. 0.003. What the hell does that mean? So it's like 73 cents to 100 yen. Yeah, 70, 73 cents to 100 yen. So if you reverse that, can we go dollar yen? Dollar yen. It is one 137.66 Japanese yen to the dollar. So basically, you can think of... Uh, it's kind of hard now because inflation really screwed everything up in America. But if you usually we, we like to think of like one dollar equals a hundred yen, like yeah. one cent is one yen. And so if you think of it that way, like and with all the competitive prices that are happening right now in Japan, because everybody's so you know bleeding, there's want customers. Uh, Japan's probably like fifty percent off. You can just think about it that way. Like the whole country is like fifty percent off. Yeah, well, like I'm just looking at it over time, and this is the weakest it's been in like 30 years. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's an all time low, and in our lifetime, it absolutely is. I mean, like we're talking like pop of the bubble time. Yeah, and it's like it's yeah, it's pretty. Now that that's artificial. It's artificial on some levels. They're using quantitative easing, which is equal sign printing money. Right. Which is how the world works apparently now since 2008. Um, and so uh, that, that's not going to last forever, but it'll probably stay like this until for another year or so, unless something spectacularly weird happens. But again, I'm no doctor, no scientist, no economist. Don't trust me. Just listen. And, you know, I wonder what people do while they listen to the show. I think they're like doing the dishes. This is what I, I lo- listen to a lot of po- podcasts while doing the dishes. I listen to a lot of podcasts while I'm exercising. Yeah. So if you're exercising... Below. Or doing the dishes, let us know. Comment below. Or something else. Maybe you're all right, getting but, intimate. All right, I'm going to... Hey, if you're doing that, nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, let's see. Let me do one more serious one, and then we'll go to a fun story. Okay, so Japan... Oh, so this is in timing with the all the tourism boom. I'm just kidding about this, by the way. This has nothing to do with that. Um, Japan reverses course on post-Fukushima nuclear ban. Because of course they did, because there was no way that this was ever going to work without nuclear power. Uh, The plan is effectively a total reversal of Japan's post-Fukushima nuclear strategy that saw it shutter existing plants and put a moratorium on new nuclear projects, thus ending an 11-year prohibition prohibition, uh, on the use of the technology. In addition to reigniting existing reactors, I don't really think that's the right verb for that, uh, and and building fresh ones, Kishida, the prime minister, said the Japanese government would also look into expanding the life expectancy of existing reactors. In many cases, Reuters... Not Reuters. Do you guys know that? It's Reuters. Um, uh, pointed out Japan previously decommissioned nuclear power plants when they reached 60 years of op- operation. Cause, so like a human. You know how like the retirement age was like 60 and now it's like 65? Mm. The same thing for nuclear reactors because that's exactly how that's supposed to work. Anyway, look, guys, you can't have Japan without nuclear power. There's just no way to work. I mean, maybe if we invested trillions and trillions in renewables and made like some of the largest investments known to man into like battery technology and just had like oceans of floating batteries where we could like absorb all the daytime energy into for nighttime use maybe maybe (laughs) but there's just no there's i mean geothermal that they could do they could do geothermal but still with geothermal there's there's transmission issues and stuff like that okay you can't do it all over the country um and in some places the geothermal energy here is still unstable we have an erupting volcano that's true i mean you, can, you don't want to drill into it yeah <laughs> it's not a good I, idea i don't want to poke the sleeping bear no you don't okay so there there are some opportunities for that in the country uh hydroelectric is kind of capped i mean they've dammed and and concreted all the rivers already so it's not real much growth there i mean it's not like the three gorges dam in, in china they don't have that kind of size or capacity um then what else you got wind okay wind is a land issue right you could put a bunch of sea uh, a bunch of windmills out at sea which which i think that they should do um kill a lot of birds you know that's always what happens but that's fine i mean that's good to i don't mean the killing birds <laughs> things but the wind wind electricity is good 
Um, and honestly, a lot of the, the shorelines in Japan is so industrified anyways. Yeah. It do- won't make a difference. The shoreline of most of Japan does not look very good. It doesn't good. look great because it's all industrial. So, you know, fuck it. Put a bunch of wind, windmills out there. That's fine. I mean, there's here in Kagoshima, they have tons of wind energy on the, on the mountains. So, I mean, that's that's a possibility. But even with all of that said and done, if you're not burning a fossil fuel on top of that, you're not powering the country. Right. So you've either got, let's burn a bunch of fossil fuels, which I think uh, what was France and Germany's plan after Fukushima, right? Or, and that's not a good idea because they were like, oh, let's buy natural gas from Russia. Mm. And then Russia's like, oh, we're going to have a little war. That didn't turn out very, No, No, very so that's good. just not good. So you either do that or you do nuclear nuclear power. And nuclear power is, and it's not nu- nuclear, I don't know how they say that. The what, Bush? Bush, the nu- nuclear, how do they say it? It's not even how you spell the word. Spell the word, nuclear. Nuclear? I don't know, I don't whatever. Remember. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so without nuclear power, it just doesn't work. Now, here's one thing that I think that we should really consider. And this is actually in the, I think it's called uh, Bill Gates' Brain or something like that. It's a Netflix documentary, I think. But one of the things that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which if you think that they're behind COVID, you're stop subbing to our channel. Go away. Um, you know, people <laughs> think that they're like, yeah. Bill Gates made COVID. I'm like, are you stupid? Like, like where, how many, how many like logical jumps does your silly little brain need to make to like, how many contortions did I have to do to say the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation made COVID? They're responsible for this pandemic. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean... He did give that TED talk, yeah, which was right on the nose, but yeah. he was saying, let's prepare guys. Yeah. Had we prepared, we wouldn't have probably had a pandemic. It might've been like a small little outbreak or something, but it wouldn't like gotten this bad. Right. We didn't prepare. What was it like? They, they told us to prepare. We didn't prepare. There's some line in the movie like that. Anyway. So now there are, there are new and somewhat untested nuclear technologies that are probably safer than what we're currently using. Because the technology, the nuclear power plants that we're using right now, they were de- designed in the 60s or sometimes in the 50s. So now there are, there are updated and better, possibly better ways to do nuclear power, smaller scale, less risk, things like that. And that should absolutely be uh, explored. I totally believe in that. But you don't get a prosperous GDP growing Japan it, without either lots of fossil fuels, which we don't want because that's, you know, climate change. We don't want that. Um, or nuclear power because I just don't see how it's going to work. Yeah. So Kushida is completely right. First time I think I'm agreeing with Kushida on anything. So sorry. Well, cheers to that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, hey, Fukushima was fucking scary. I was here for it. Yeah. Like I lived through it. Right. I, I mean, the, I, I remember like looking at produce because they have to say what prefecture it's from mm. and going, is this from northern Japan? Like yeah. It was fucking scary. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, like I moved to Japan the year after uh, Fukushima happened, but I remember like. And it's not past tense. Out. It's still going yeah, on. Yeah, it's still going on now. But like. There were a lot of people, like, when I moved to Japan, everyone was telling me, like, hey, when you go buy your groceries, you got to look and see where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And it was a little scary. And, and, hey, that happened. That happened. And, you know, they're still trying to clean it up today. And, you know, the the sarcophagus that's going over Chernobyl. Okay, that's scary shit. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It is. When it goes wrong, it goes catastrophic. I mean, there's there's a nuclear power plant right now in, in disputed territory in Ukraine that might, like, end the whole world. That Yeah, it is scary. Don't get me wrong. But you, there are ways to do it responsibly. And one of the things that we learned from Fukushima, don't put your, because we, I think we talked about this before, that, that nuclear power plants require power even when they're off right. to cool them. And so like one of the things that, that they learned from Fukushima is don't put your generators at sea level because there might be a giant wave coming from the ocean that's called a tsunami named in Japanese because they come to Japan all the time. Yeah. You know, so we learned. Good job. <laughs> But anyway, um, I mean, on a serious note, without nuclear power, I just don't see how it works. And so I get it. People were scared of it. It sucks when it goes wrong, but let's try to make it better. Don't don't just run away from the technology because like, you know, and a lot of any serious scientist will say we're not going to solve climate change without nuclear power. And then here's another thing, you know, coal burning um, uh, um, power generating facilities, they burn coal and in coal, there is actually radioactive materials that cause way more cancer in the surrounding populations than any nuclear disasters ever caused. So think about that pro coal retards. Oh, I said the word. 
I said the word. You said it. I said. You ridiculous people. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be ableist. Anyway, you go, let's go to a fun story. Well, I don't know how fun it is, but Japanese scientists... Oh, don't do that <laughs> one now. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Japanese scientists succeed at causing depression in monkeys using magnetic stimulation. I was being so good. I, just, I hadn't said that word in so long. How, how long has it been? It's been probably... 15, 20 episodes, I think. It's been so good. Sorry, everybody. I do apologize for my my inappropriate yeah. word language. And it's but. not just on the show, too. Like you, I, yeah, I, I, I haven't heard you say trying to cut it out at all. Trying yeah. to cut it out of my language. I don't like me using that word. It's just you know, you when you grow up around you know people who have foul language and you get used to it, and then when you grow up and you're like, okay, I shouldn't say these words anymore. Right. Right. And you and I did that for most of all we talked about this, like most words. That was the one that just stuck around because it was still kind of used like on the regular. And then recently, like the last, you know, five, six years, it's like, don't use that's ableism and stuff yeah. like that. So that that's like the last holdout. I haven't found a good substitute for it yet. Yeah. Gonna try. Well, if you guys, hey, comment below if you got a great uh, substitute your, for the R word. What's your favorite insult that is not an NG word? I could just make it like a silly word, like you silly pants. Just like say stuff like that. Yeah, and that's a good one. That might be okay. Anyway, sorry. Anyways, Japanese scientists succeed at causing depression in monkeys using magnetic stimulation. So <laughs> there was like three shows ago where there was like a, 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 a section of northern Japan where they were at war with the local monkeys. Yeah. And now they're making them depressed. I wonder if they're the same monkeys. Well, we can get to like how they did that. But later on in the article, they talk about how there has been a lot of like backlash to it. A lot of people are saying like. Yeah, because like, it's really sad. <laughs> like, stop that. Stop making the monkeys depressed. <laughs> it's really sad. Yeah. But they point out that it wasn't the researchers intention to be like, hey, let's make these monkeys depressed. Like they were just testing to see what would happen. Yeah. And the result was, oh it makes them depressed. But that is something that's useful for us because our brains are similar to monkey brains and we can not make people depressed that way. Okay. Okay. So it's it's tricky, right? Because like on the one hand, a lot of research that we got, that le- medical knowledge that we have came from animal research. Right. I mean, just about everything that has life-saving that's come out like the last 50 years has been tests on rats and things like that. And so you think about it, you're like, is that fucked up? Answer, yes, it is. Um, but on the other, I mean, and then here's the other big question we have to answer. Will our children's 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 like forgive us? Mm. Right. And then here's the other one. Like, here's one. Me- the meat industry. Think about that. Yeah. I mean, factory grown like pigs and chickens who've never seen the light of day, you know, like forced to live in tiny little cages so that we get cheap meat in the, in the supermarket. Will our children's children's children forgive us on that? Yeah. It's, that's pretty messed up. No, like, it's <laughs> right messed up. It's pretty messed up. Like, it's really fucked up. Uh, that's, that's something that like I do struggle with because like, especially recently I've been watching a lot of documentaries about food and stuff just because one, like I want to watch documentaries and two, I just, I like food, Yeah. but a lot of food documentaries are pretty fucked up. <laughs> like they show a lot of things that like make me feel like, Oh God, there's a Chipotle commercial that is so powerful. It's an animated, it's like either claymation or 3d, it's 3d animated. And it's like about the meat industry and mm. it is fucked up. By Chipotle? By Chipotle. Isn't Chipotle like a big meat? Well, because they're saying that they're, they source their meat from responsible oh, people. Oh, I see, I see. And so, I mean, honestly, as consumers, that's what we all should be doing. Like, right. where does this meat come from? If you're going to eat meat, which I mean, the, the best thing for the planet is not to eat meat. But that's not going to happen in my lifetime for me, probably. Is it the best thing, though? It is, because... You you save a lot of water and you save a lot of like because the to make meat you yeah. have to they have to eat something right it uses a lot of resources to, and to yeah to grow so to it's it's the stepping up of the energy right so like the 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 more consolidated the energy you get there's waste in that right so if you just go straight to the source the grown stuff then you know there you go but I don't know if it is it good to completely cut out all meat from your diet yeah you mean as a health thing yeah as a health thing. There's a lot of conflicting information on that. There's actually a full documentary that made me think about going vegan. Uh, and I, I, it's called The Problem with Meat or something like that. I forgot what it is. It's on some one of the streaming services. And it, like they, they tested like athletes' blood, like when they had like an all veggie diet versus like mixing in like, you know, animal based products and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And like they were much more powerful, much healthier when they only ate plant food and stuff like that. 
Really? I don't know how much I believe this. Yeah, because like <laughs> the documentary I just watched basically That's says the I'm opposite saying. thing. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like the documentary I, I uh, watch talked about the reason why some people add like butter and stuff to their coffee, which I think sounds disgusting. Yeah. But it's talking about how like healthy animal fats are actually better for you than so that's yeah that's a little bit different you're talking about a product that an animal produces which is milk right that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about eating the animal right yeah i mean there's that too but it, it's just that whole documentary talked about how switching to like a no carb uh diet with high protein and high fat is much healthier for you than the key, the keto diet right yeah the keto diet so basically that's my diet that's how, i mean dude i like lost all this weight you know i'm pumping up because i eat nothing but chicken and broccoli that's like my go-to meal, like twice a day, chicken and broccoli. Yeah. Sorry, chickens. Yeah. <laughs> but at least my chicken comes from Kagoshima and it's from, it's from, you know, pasteurized. They're not, they're not all like crammed into a, you know, it's, it's fine. They're happy. They're happier. Right. But anyway, uh, the meat, anytime you get on the, the subject of meat, there are some people who are incredibly passionate about becoming mm -hmm. vegan. And listen to me, if you're one of those vegans out there, I understand. And I actually believe in your cause. I just don't think I can do it because I'm kind of a wuss, I guess. I don't know. I just, I, it's, it's just so much work to do it. Yeah. But the more vegans are out there, here's one thing I want to compliment you guys on. I, and I usually make fun of vegans and vegetarians because we have one in our, in our school. And I'm always like, whenever she's eating something, I'm like, oh, uh, oh, uh, uh. she's like, nope, it's not, it's not meat. I think we might have two now. Whatever. So, um, one thing I will compliment you vegans and vegetarians on, you are actually pushing industry changes making more and more vegetarian and vegan options available at a cheaper price. And so it's making it easier and easier for people to turn to veganism. So congratulations. You guys are actually doing it. You're making a change. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Just, you know, with all things, you know, it take, let's take the Japanese way on it. You know, everything in moderation. Right. Don't be like, a, you know, a crazy person about it. But like, I mean, bring back to it though. Like, like you said, a lot of uh, breakthroughs in our lifetime and before our lives they did come through animal testing and like no yeah. like what is the best thing to do then like is it better to not test on animals or is it better to not well have the, these breakthroughs well the answer is here's the answer simulation using computer technology that's the answer right so it, like you know we just we just recently figured out how po proteins fold using ai okay and so the, the smarter and smarter our machine learning gets, the better we can predict and, and, uh, um, and uh, what is it called? We can synthesize things, right? right? And so simulate it and then try it in a computer before we try anything on anything living. So that will be the future. Right. Mm -hmm. We're just not, we're just, we're smart enough to know that what we're doing is wrong, Yeah. <laughs> but we're not smart enough to figure out a different method. That's really effective. That's the problem mm -hmm. with a lot of things that's going on in the world right now. We're smart enough to know that it's wrong. The climate change. Everyone knows that when you get in your car and you drive around that you're like doing your part to put a little bit of, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere. And so we know that that's not good, but we also don't, I mean, we do have solutions. Um, climate town. I've talked about this YouTuber so many times. He's great by the way, climate town, check him out. He's a great YouTuber. He talks about climate change in a very funny and digestible way. It's actually hilarious. It doesn't make you depressed. It just makes you, and he, t he has call to action at the end of all of his videos that really make you want to do something. I uh, haven't done anything yet, but <laughs> <laughs> he's but, calling for yeah. the actions. Well, I've, I've been resisting buying a car. I haven't, I haven't mm. owned a car and I think geez, 12 or 13 years or something like that. I've been really resisting buying a car um, and it hasn't until recently work has been made in a kind of a necessity, but I'm still resisting it. And I would really like to be able to buy an EV because when I was in America for that week, everybody's got a Tesla and I think EVs are super cool. Yeah. Uh, speaking of technology, here we go. Um, going to go to this. This is actually probably our most serious uh, story, but it's not, it's not like serious, serious. It's just kind of fun. Can a sleepy Japanese town become Asia's Silicon Valley? And I was talking about this off camera. This is a principle called the Better Ridges Law of Headlines. And it says, Better Ridges Law of Hedge Headlines is an adage that says, that states, any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered with the word no. Yeah. So can a sleepy town, Japanese town become Asia's next Silicon Valley? So the answer is no. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, located on a Southern Island in, in Shikoku. If you've ever, have you, you've never been to Shikoku, have, have you? Have you? Yeah. My Japanese school in Osaka, my class uh, rented a bus when we graduated and we went to Shikoku. We went to around Shikoku. 
you know what was that game called pandemic or infection or whatever it's called breakout yeah outbreak i think it's called like pandemic or something like that and like madagascar yeah and greenland in greenland the... it's like shut everything down or whatever like shikoku is like if the world was like japan shikoku is like the madagascar like where just no one goes yeah but it's actually a pretty dope place yeah. <laughs> no, no, there's a couple there's a couple sleepy towns in Shikoku that are pretty dope. I'm not gonna lie. I, I like Shikoku. And you can get there on I think it either still is or was the world's largest suspension bridge. Can you Google that? Oh, one? are you talking about like the I forgot the name of it. It's the like Naruto bridge or whatever. Yeah, whatever it's called. I don't know. It's a huge bridge and it it's cool as fuck. It's like longer than shit. Yeah, I I, I went there. The O Naruto bridge, I think. Yeah. The it, su- suspension bridge. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's still the longest, but it was in the 90s when I went there. <laughs> I'll, I'll look this up while so you're... So I'm going to read. So located on the southern island of Shikoku, the sleepy rural region doesn't have a reputation for being a thriving place. But the area, which has been suffering from both an aging and shrinking population for decades, will soon welcome a bunch of vibrant, young, new residents. In April next year, a, a school of tech entrepreneurship uh the first kind first of its kind in japan will open in tokushima town of kamiyama the students aged 15 to 20 will be taught engineering programming and designing as well as business skills such as uh, skills such as marketing they will also learn how to pitch their business plans to investors in order to raise money the man behind it is chikahiro ta uh, i cannot read japanese words in english Tera- Terada, uh, the, the boss of the Tokyo-based startup Sansan, which specializes in the digitalization of business cards. Uh, these still play, which unfortunately still play a huge role in Japan. I hate business cards. Um, he says, 12 years ago, I set up a remote, remote office here because I heard that Kamiyama is an interesting town with a high-speed internet capacity in empty old houses, he said. Uh, I thought that it, uh, I might get told off if I still if I said I wanted to open an office here without helping out the town, so he offered uh, to teach computing at the local el- to the local elderly pro- population. And then he went on to raise money, and now he's uh, building a school, uh, that, or built a school that will open in April. So that's really fucking cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, she could actually probably go tour that place and just find out what he's doing there. That's cool as shit. I mean, I that I was just I was in a you don't know this. I was in an uh, an advisory meeting. Me, our banker, and like three very important like higher up people in in two in local government, one uh, in a in an advisory board, and we're like we're like it's like me and my my vp and we're like the kids in the room we're like okay so how do we grow our business responsibly and they're like well children and they're like explaining all this stuff to us but one of the things that i said i was i'm kidding that's not exactly (laughs) but one of the things that i said to them is like it sucks in japan because there's no vc venture capitalist funding here Mm. um in in silicon valley you have an idea like you know those 25 companies that all had the idea to like right now make really slick fitting t-shirts for men that are being advertised all yeah, over all social media. Right. Every day I get those nine ads. different companies yeah. are doing the same fucking thing because somebody got the idea and then it got in spread. And then all these VC uh, venture capitalists wouldn't put a bunch of millions of dollars behind it. And they're all probably sourced from the same fucking place, mm. but whatever stuff like that can happen. And you know, shit that takes off, takes off. I mean, Uber, yeah. It just took off and now it's all over the world. Yeah. And then it spread onto like Uber Eats and then there Lyft are like. and other things, yeah. you know, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, stuff like that can happen, but that only happens when you have a bunch of crazy money to find, to fund your idea. If it's like, you got to make a profit and then using your profit, slowly build a, an empire. That's going to take generations. Yeah. I mean, like most of the big companies in the world, they didn't make a profit for years and Amazon years. Amazon didn't make a profit for, I think, 12 years or something like that. Like the joke in the room is like, when are you guys going to turn a profit? Now they're like, you can't, you can't get away from their profits. Yeah. It's like, you know, they're like, I mean, that that's how business works now. Right. Now there's a high failure rate and a lot of loss of money with that because mm. it is gambling. But if you're not doing that, then you, it's kind of hard to compete on a, on a global scale. Anyway, let's go to a fun one. All right. Uh, it's good to have problems. <laughs> Hayao Miyazaki tells Studio Ghibli staff. So uh, here's what Miyazaki-san had to say to the staff in the morning. Uh, It's okay to have a problem you're struggling with. When you're really, really struggling, that's when a new idea will pop out. Struggling is a kind of talent. So he said this because uh, even though Studio Ghibli has a ton of money now, basically, and they don't have to like worry about all the things that Studio Ghibli had to worry about when they were first starting. Uh, they still have a lot of things that they have to worry about, like 
they have to reach a lot of new heights that uh, and a lot of expectations that uh, the studio didn't have to initially right when they were a new company nobody expected them to do anything so it was they had different kinds of struggles so i think he was just kind of like motivating his staff saying like hey it's good that we're struggling like if you don't struggle then uh, i'll tell you what, the the second the school got kind of like financially st- stable where i didn't have to struggle every day i kind of got bored it's the fight that's the fun part it's the scrappiness it's the hustle it's the we're gonna not maybe survive like how do we make ends meet? That's the fun part of business. The boring part is like, okay, what are our numbers? What are we doing today? The same thing we did that this day last year. That's boring as shit. <laughs> so I agree. That is good advice. Struggle is good. And then every time you struggle, you learn and grow and become stronger. Yeah. I mean, I mean that's that's that look forward to the struggle. Yeah, I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm struggling right now with our video company. I'm struggling. Yeah, no, that's, it's important. It's important. It's good. Yeah. Speaking of struggle, Japan eyes stockpiling t- a thousand long-range missiles amid China tensions. Okay. Basically, they realized that and this is such a stupid quote from this article. Let's see, where does it say? It says. Uh, da, 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 da. I it's it's somewhere in here. It's basically like. In making its estimate, the Japanese government researched the number of missiles and the required budget that would need to, to counter Chinese missiles based on the assumption that Beijing possess, possesses a large number of missiles that can be used to attack Japan. And they're like, because Japan is an island country, the, the method of attack will likely be missiles. I'm like, no, there's no other way of attacking. Like, I mean... Even look at the the Russia Ukraine conflict. They're next door to each other, and like it's just missiles lobbing at each other. Yeah. And so yeah, anything air you know air superiority or anything that you know a missile is a very hard target to hit. Anti missile and missile systems like the Iron Dome over Israel, for example. Oh my God, that is. If you ever look at the economics behind that conflict. Hezbollah will fire off a rocket that costs like maybe $150. And then the Iron Dome will spend fifty to one hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars shooting it down. That's that's lopsided. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's very lopsided. So yeah, everything is gonna be you know, everything in the it, it, everything in the future is either missile or or drone based. You see those fun little demonstrations of China at the China Beijing Olympics where like, oh, we can make a surf uh, a, a what is it called? A a, a, a snowboarder out of using our drones, the little lights and everything. You're like, that's not what that tech is for. That tech is to fight wars. Yeah, I mean, it looks cool, and then you put a bomb on it, and then... All no. of a sudden, you're yeah. like... And then you realize that drones can go up to, like, 300 kph, and you're like, wow, that's kind of scary. Yeah. I mean, right now, in the Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict, they, don't do not do this. Don't do this. There's a subreddit on, on Reddit that shows how they're using Chinese DGI... Is that right? DGI drones... So is that the company's name or is it D-I-G? D-G-I? D-J-I? D-J-I. That is D-J-I. Yeah, the ones that make the Mavic. They're yeah. using those drones to fight the war. And like the Chinese government is like, we don't approve of it. like, well, the tech's out there, guys. You can reformat the tech to do everything you want. So, I mean, the future is going to be scary. Anyway, I agree with Japan's budgeting to get more defenses because... As we saw from the, the Ukraine thing, if both countries are strong as fuck and militarily like powerful, then there will be peace. Mm. If you have uh, a superior country next door or with some interest in invading an inferior country, that's when it happens. That's why you don't see any war between you know uh, nuclear capable countries. It's called a nuclear umbrella for a reason. No nuclear country has gone to war with another, another nuclear country except through proxies in the, in, since World War II. So... So yeah, Japan, I do believe in a large and very, you know, strong defense because I live here. That's all. <laughs> Next one. All right. Egg slut. Egg at, slut. From China whole, war to egg slut. That's a whole ass eel to a new sandwich in Japan. So egg slut, I think, is a U.S. egg specialty chain restaurant. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> I've never been to one. It's amazing. Egg slut's great. But they... Uh, Open up a store in Shinjuku, Japan, and they sent a... Every time I hear Shinjuku, I can't help but think about the song. Oh, Shinjuku so big, oh, I need to throw my own. Yeah, it's yeah. so good. Love that song. Anyway, so uh, for their Japan restaurant, they made a Japan-exclusive sandwich no. called the 
una tama egg sandwich. Una being unagi or eel, and tama being tamago egg. And so they just basically just put a giant eel inside of a egg sandwich. sandwich. I just cannot see how eel, which is sweet, right? Because they use the sauce on it. it. It's like a sweet and salty sauce that they put on the eel, yeah. Plus egg. I guess. Well, I mean, like, people put ketchup on eggs, and ketchup is, like, sweet and salty. Yeah, I don't remember the last time. Oh, no, I, I I ordered a cheeseburger, and it came with a fuck ton of ketchup on it, and I regretted it. I don't like ketchup. I like ketchup. I'm not a ketchup guy. I don't no. like sweet stuff. Yeah. I don't like... But how does... The, I, here's a question. How does ketchup last forever? It's I think probably I, because all the sugar in it, it's like jam. It's basically tomato jam. Tomato jam. That's gross. This shit lasts last forever. I, I think I have like a ketchup. It, do you say ketchup or ketchup? Who says ketchup? I don't know. Comment below if you say ketchup. <laughs> and I hope nobody comments because nobody actually says that. There's this test from the New York Times on their website from like, I don't know, five years ago or something like that. And it just asks you like six questions. Like, how do you say this word? How do you say this word? How do you say this word? Like and it soda. Can, yeah. Or, it can like figure out where you're from. Yeah. It's like, you're from this region. I was like, wow. I thought it was cool. All right. Let's talk about something sad. It's, it's a little sad. And I was just, I was just here with my ex like, like two months ago. No, like a month and a half ago. Tokyo's giant Ferris wheel is closing for good. So it's time to, for one last ride. Unless you don't live in the country. Then, it's, you know, maybe you won't make it because it's uh, Godiva's uh, giant Ferris wheel will be, will be closing. Uh, it's the giant sky wheel. It'll be closing uh, on August 31st. Now, I went here thinking I wanted to go to the outlet mall and I didn't Google it. Neither of us Googled it and we showed up at the outlet mall and it was closed. It was called uh, Pallet Town or whatever. I have no idea. That's, but like That's the Pokemon starting town. Isn't it Pilot Town? I don't know. Anyway, we were, this is my first time ever going there. And then it was all closed down and like boarded off and stuff. But you could still access the, the Ferris wheel, which is like in the middle of this giant like outlet complex. Okay. So it looked like a zombie run. Have you ever seen one of those zombie runs where they do like live action zombie runs in like towns? I don't know. Well, anyway, it looked like it looked very like like post apocalyptic and scary. And, and I took a lot of pictures, but it was cool. Anyway, the giant, the, the giant Ferris wheel there will be closing. So why is it closing? Because the whole thing is just closing. It's just going away. Oh. Yeah. See, and here's the thing. The closest station is Tokyo Teleport, which is a fucking shit station because it's so far away. So if you ever go to Odaiba, the only reason why you're going to go there to see the giant, uh, what is that thing called? Uh, 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 I just brain farted. The giant tech bot things. What are they called? Hello, anybody? Giant tech bot things. <laughs> Come on. They fight. What, the mechs? Yeah, what are they called? The Gundams? Gundam. There you go. That's the word. Thank you. Straight up brain farted there. Uh, yeah, you see the giant Gundam at the uh, shopping center, the new shopping center that's like cl- more inland than the, than the old uh, outlet that they closed. And so the only reason to go there is to see the giant Gundam. The thing is, is to get there, you go to the te- Tokyo teleport station and then you have to walk like forever and you have to go over a land bridge to get there. It's really unnecessarily inconvenient, but yeah, but looking at the giant Gundam was cool. I think there's two now in Tokyo. I couldn't, don't, don't quote me on that, but I think there's two now, but yeah, it was, it's, it's a cool, if you're, if you're into Instagram and you want to go make, take a good Instagram photo, it's a cool place to go. I think I saw one in, there's one in like Akihabara, right? Yeah, they they have they have one that moves as well. I don't know. I'm not really into Gundam. I don't know. Did you guys know that in the book Ready Player One, the the last uh, mech fight thing was not Gundam. It was actually Ultraman, but because the rights for Ultraman were in dispute when Spielberg made his movie, they made it into Gundam. Mm, that's right. Forgot which, about that. Which was okay, except for the emotionality of the theater because i watched it in the theater in japan when he says ah what do he says like ore wa gundam de iku, or whatever it is and it's like a line straight from the, the anime series and so like all the nerd boys including me got a little like you know emotional in that part but but i knew secretly in, on the inside that that was actually supposed to be ultraman for me it was more the uh ready player one they had all the dungeon and dragons references in the beginning of the book and then like they just completely cut it out of the well movie. how are you gonna visualize that i know but it would have been cool if he was going through like a like a like an ancient tomb or something like that and one just- thing that brian one of our friends brian pointed out he's like he's like have you ever played a video game before the very first thing that happened in that race scene yeah, yeah like yeah, five exactly. people would have backed up yeah like 
half of them not even intentionally they would just hit the wrong button and be like oh i unlocked the first key okay yeah the book was way better guys if you ever get a chance to read ready Ready player one if you haven't read it it was a good book yeah it was a really i make i force my staff to read it the first one was a good at the second one i was second one was like it's it just keeps going yeah it's not fun anymore the first one the magic was gone yeah but the first one is really good it's kind of like ender's game ender's game the first book was amazing and then after a while you're just like oh it just keeps going huh You've never read that book before. I haven't read that book, no. Yeah, you should read Edward's Game. It's really good. Uh, I'm going to go... What's your... Uh, don't. That one's going to be the last one. Oh, no. That one... Let's go to that one, then this will be our last one. Brad Pitt hops on the bullet train to Kyoto, gets teary at a temple, and receives a Pasmo card in Japan. So he rides the bullet train to Kyoto because they just came out with his movie. Bullet train. Bullet train. Are you going to see it? Yeah, I'm actually going to watch I don't think I'll see, I'll see it in theaters, but I'll watch it at home. Yeah. I don't want to watch movies in the theaters anymore. I just love my 4K screen and my, my wonderful wireless headphones and not having to go to a theater. And I got an Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Because you were drunk. Because I was drunk. <laughs> and it is so much better than streaming. Noticeably better. Uh, one thing that's kind of, I think, kind of cool about movie theaters in japan uh you can drink alcohol yeah you get beers but yeah but then the problem is if it's like a high action movie it starts to make you nauseated oh i've never had that experience i did have like a glass of wine at a movie theater once and it was a really nice movie theater in tokyo so i was like it's kind of cool what were you watching tell me it was like disney or something probably you're like i'm I'm enjoying my chardonnay with (laughs) monsters inc or something (laughs) like 20 kids sitting around me but anyways so uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. So he, he, I think, <laughs> went, went to a temple or something. Oh yeah, that's what it was. That he visited a temple and he said that he found the experience to be incredibly moving, saying he almost got teary eyed and it was something he would never forget. Uh, because they they did like a whole ritual ritual uh to cleanse the bad luck from, from the movie from the movie. So, okay, two things. One, Shinto does this. I think that's a Shinto shrine that they went to. Shinto does this. You can actually take your car to a Shinto shrine and with a bunch of other people that just bought their new cars and you pay them, I don't know, like $300. And then they do this this thing where they remove all the bad luck or whatever from your car. Why would a new car have bad luck? Shut up. You're thinking too much about it. If it was like an nope. old car, someone got killed in it. Oh my then, God. Then I would understand. You're, nope. So I'm just saying. So remember how last week when me and Natsuki were talking about making a religion, uh, or maybe it was the week before with, maybe it's just like recurring theme, but yeah. definitely religion is a thing to do. But yeah, that is a thing that they do do that. I'm, I'm not trying to make fun of the culture. I just think religion is silly. Um, and so they, they do that. And so this is like a, uh, they, they actually do this for uh, construction as well. Oh, um, like houses. You, before you construct a, a, a house. I don't know if I should say this. Um, I actually know, um, no, I don't think I should say that, but there, uh, there was a construction project that I, that was being handled by a Japanese company in an American city and they, the Japanese workers refu- wouldn't, weren't moving. They wouldn't do anything. And then one of the, the project managers said, did you guys hire a Shinto priest to go out there and bless the site? And then the, the, the managers were all these, you know, Western people. They're like, what are you talking about? And then they pushed, they did that. And then they started working on it. Like there's just, there are companies and people out there that will not move unless it gets blessed first by a Shinto priest. Huh. Yeah. Isn't it also something like once you get a new house or something like you throw yeah, money, you throw, yeah, you throw, throw money, money off? off the top of it. Yeah. That's a, that's different. That's not the same. Okay. Thing. I thought it was <laughs> something similar. But. That's, that's a different thing. We could talk about that some other time. I think uh, Alex has actually done that. So when he gets on the show, maybe, or maybe even not ski, cause they both have houses. So. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, actually, did you, we should get Natsuki to tell the story about how her husband bought her a house because they, they had a house before. They didn't have a shower. They just had oh, a bath. Yeah. They, and they yeah. had like bucket water under each other because it was like this really cheap place that they had like since like they were young adults. It's like the Totoro house. Yeah, it was like a Totoro house. And then like she was like, you know, I really want a shower. So he bought her like this like quarter million dollar house and he just goes around telling people that. He's just, like... Just for the shower. Quarter million dollars for Natsuki's sh- shower. <laughs> anyway uh so yeah anyway that's the two things i want to say one the shinto thing it's real that they do do that in japan it is it's a big thing and two brad pitt's fucking i've never i used to work for cirque du soleil and i met a lot of famous people right you know like you name it i've met them and most of the people are kind of just normal people they're just trying to hang out um uh when i when i met i haven't met brad pitt yet but i've met a lot of people who have met brad pitt and everybody says that he's like a super genuine good person that's nice yeah 
Because, like, you know, you hear, like, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey was great. Mm. Jim Carrey was one of the nicest, humblest people I've ever met in my entire life. And he was gigantic, really tall, too. Yeah, I've heard that, that he's a lot taller than you expect. Very tall. I was just like, I, it just kind of like, because, you know, movie magic, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and uh, Tom Cruise was very short. I've heard Tom Cruise is very intense mm. all the time. I, I didn't directly meet him. I just watched him for a little bit, and I was just like, yeah, he just seemed intense. But but anyway, uh, one person I do want to meet is is Brad Pitt because I just think that he's probably you could sit down and have a, a beer with him. And a, according to legend, I don't know if this is true or not. He has like Harley's just like parked around the country where he, in, in 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 America where he just like flies in and like drives around his Harley's. I'm like that's cool. I, I do I do like Brad Pitt. Anyway, uh, last last story today, um, and I'm gonna shit on so- Soda News 24, where sometimes we we source our more sillier news from. So there's a it's the I'll just read the headline and then just summarize the article because it's like it's long. Um, it's it's the almost immediate problems in our almost no plan trip to Yakushima. So if you don't know what Yakushima is, it's a little island off the it's a Kagoshima Prefecture island off the coast of the mainland uh, Kyushu uh, land formation, and it is the inspiration for princess mononoke okay and it is like gorgeous like you go there the air is just different it's just magical it's just an amazing beautiful place okay now it's not a city it's like right. rural it's nature yeah in this reporter i don't know it's seiji he went there on purpose with no plan and so this article complains about a bunch of shit. So I'm just going to, I'm just, I'm just going to say he had trouble going from the airport to the Island. And then he didn't, you know, he, there was no cars there. So, and there was no taxi drivers and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Here's how you do Yakushima for all of you people who are listening to the show, who actually want to do Yakushima right. And not be like this dummy dummy. I can say dummy. Yeah. Is that offensive? Is that ableist in some way? I mean, a dummy is like a, a mannequin, right? Yeah. So I'm just going to eat dummy. Okay. So Seiji, you dummy. Um, I'm kidding. I have no idea who you are. But uh, this, first of all, you don't want to fly directly to Yakushima. Flights are very, very expensive. And no one does that unless you're super rich. You fly into Kagoshima City or you go to Fukuoka first and screw around there and Shinkansen, the bullet train down to Kagoshima City. And then your your goal is to get to, you want you want to get to not Kagoshima Chuo Station. You want to get to Kagoshima Station, which is actually kind of in the, it's, it's away from the major center of the city. And then you take a, cat, a taxi cab to what's called the Tapi, Topi, which is the hydrofoil, mm. which is the skis on water aircraft boat thing. And um, if you're young, Tell them that you're a student. Hopefully you are a student. But if you are a student, you get a student discount. Oh, okay. And even if you're a university student. So do that. Then go to the... I think they show... They, they ask us... Yeah, so you your, probably your need your proof. Yeah. <laughs> then go to the island. But before you do that, before you go to the island, read the um, the website called Yaku Monkey. Mm. Okay. It's, it's in two forms. It's actually in three forms. It's a website. It's a PDF that circulates around on the internet. And then there's a book that you can buy. Right. Yaku Monkey will explain everything that you need to know about Yakushima, um, including all the places to go, all the people to see like direct, like, like we're not talking like, a, like, like your, your vague directions. It's like, go to this place and talk to this person level of guide. I'll, I'll put the link for it in the de- description below. And if you do that, you'll have a great time. You'll enjoy your, your stay in Yakushima and you'll come back with a lot of memories. If you go like this dude with no plan and have no idea what you're getting into, because it's not the center of Tokyo, it's not, they're not going to be like convenience stores everywhere, then you're not going to have a good time. So don't do what Seiji did. I mean, I think that was the point of this article anyways, but yeah, don't do that. You can actually, and the other thing is if you're driving Japan, you can actually, uh, Chris did this. Um, Chris Abroad did this. Chris Broad from Abroad in Japan did this where he uh, took a car to the, I think it was the Yakushima. I was telling you guys, no, it was Yakushima. You can actually just drive around because getting an international driver's license is scary easy. You, if you're an American, you go to AAA, you give them $15, whatever it is with a passport photo. And then they just give you an international license and you are okay to drive in like 200 countries. That's scary. Very scary. Cause it's like, why? Everything is different in Japan. Like, why? <laughs> why does this exist? Anyway. And so if you get an international driver's license and you rent a car in Japan, um, you can drive around all of Kagoshima or all of Kyushu for that matter. Get on a ferry. It won't be the hydroflaning one, so it'll be a little bit longer, so you have to plan this out. But you can get on the ferry and then take your car to Yakushima, and then you can drive around Yakushima. 
So that's an option as well. But all that stuff you can read in the Yaku Monkey Guide. But that is how you do Yakushima. And if you are living in abroad and you want to come to Japan and you want to experience, do do the do Tokyo, do Kyoto, do Osaka, whatever. But if you want real like that Studio Ghibli magic in like its real form, Yakushima is totally where you should go. You will spiritually find yourself. You know when you're when you're playing Zelda. If you haven't beaten Breath Breath of the Wild, I'm gonna spoil something. You know the Spirit of the Mountain oh, horse yeah, that you yeah, can yeah. get, that, like deer. Yeah, that, that's yeah. inspired by Princess Mononoke. Yeah. That's inspired by Yakushima. Like that moment when you come across him in Breath of the Wild. That magical moment. Where you're like, oh my god, this is magic. That is the entire time that you're in Yakushima. It feels like that the whole time, but, it, but it's real. And it's crazy hiking. The oldest tree in the world is there, which I don't really recommend that. That's kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, it's all that stuff is in Yakushima. So go check it out if you guys have a chance. Anyway, that's been our show today. I, I actually want to ask you a question. Why is there Hawaiian flowers on our McDonald's drinks? So this year there have been a lot of different uh, stores that are doing Hawaiian themed menus. Like right now at McDonald's in Japan, they have the like local moco burger yeah they do have that they have the garlic shrimp burger and something else along with like i don't know they have a lot of different hawaiian things at mcdonald's they also had something at uh 7-eleven this year i don't know it's a year for hawaii uh loco moco weird story there everybody's like oh it's hawaiian well yes it was created in hawaii by nikkei jean by a japanese guy right so it's kind of both in a way well i mean the name too is also in spanish which means like local crazy and moco means snot. <laughs> okay. That's what I showed today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, check us out. Uh, check out the links in, uh, for all the articles that we have in the description of the video. You can also c- click on our Patreon link and become our patron if you want to support us. It pays for all of our McDonald's coffees that we regularly consume. I'm kidding. It actually makes us feel very you know, loved and it's very, very, um, what is the word? Inspiring and motivation for, um, for us to try harder on the show. Yeah. And recently, uh, in our discord channel, a lot of our patrons have been like becoming friends. I think they're always chatting with each other. I went drinking with one. I don't yeah. remember the last hour that we were hanging out. I was just <laughs> like, I the next day I was just like, what did we do? Cause it was, it was so much fun anyway. Um, yeah, check it out if you are interested. Um, and then subscribe if you're not subscribed, make sure you hit the bell icon as well on YouTube. Otherwise you will not get an, uh, an update when we post new episodes. And if you're watch, uh, listening to us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, thanks for all your support and we'll see you guys next week. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you guys so much for listening. And a special thank you to our supporters on Patreon. Jan Myler, Jen, Justin Perkins, Ellen, and Dennis P. You guys rock.